Welcome to Beyond the Gatekeepers. I am Bishop-elect Vanessa M. Brown, and I'm your host and moderator for this evening. I am looking forward to this great conversation on tonight, and we want to thank all of our social media platforms that we're on tonight. And so if you're on Facebook, you can go to Beyond the Gatekeepers page or Bishop Yvette Flunder's page. Uh, or Cara Solutions page. You can go on YouTube to uh, Beyond the Gatekeepers page or Cara Solutions page. You can go on Twitter to Beyond the Gatekeepers page. You can go on LinkedIn to uh, Cara Solutions page. So we're just all over the place on social media. We ask that you join in, that you let somebody know that this conversation is taking place. And so you know what we like to do? We like to find out where everyone is from. First of all, we say good evening to everyone and we say welcome. We're so glad that you are here. I see people online already. T Mark is in the house. Good evening to you, brother. Ronnie Jordan from Rancho Cucamonga, California is here. Uh, Bishop elect Sonia Williams is here from the ATL and happy 14th church anniversary rim. God bless you all. Uh, uh, we have Marlene McLaurin here uh, from Baltimore. Uh, Linda Lillian Cruz de Brule from Highland Park, New Jersey. Glad that you're here on this evening. Miami, Florida, Sunita is here. Thank you for watching, everyone. Latasha from ATL is here. I see you, Sarah Welch Pomerantz from Cedar Grove, New Jersey. Welcome. Yes, T Mark. Durham, North Carolina is in the house. Tanya Dully is here from North Carolina. We're so great to see you. We ask that you continue to share this Facebook Live uh, because we want to make sure that everybody is a part of this conversation. Uh, Chicago is here. I see you, Nate Tucker, Karen Coleman. Boston is in the house. 
the people are just from everywhere. We're just so grateful uh, for your presence on tonight. So grateful that you decided that you're going to tune in with us. Charleston, South Carolina, we're not going to forget you. BJ Ory, thank you. Elliot Morris is here from Chicago. Thank you so much. Kyle Butler, Brooklyn, New York. The people are coming in from everywhere. Uh, you don't have to be UCC to be a part of this conversation. So we want you to know that, right? The subject matter is goes uh, beyond the United Church of Christ. And so we want to have this conversation with everybody in the room. And so we ask that you share so that people will know. And again, we are on several social media platforms on today. And so I want uh, you all to interact with me for a few minutes if you can. Uh, I know that you've been watching the news. I know you've been watching at some point the January 6th hearings. And so uh, we are just uh, praying for our country, praying for our nation, uh, because the obstruction of justice that has taken place that we can see <laughs> with our own eyes right before us is something that would be unbelievable at any other time. Uh, but we are seeing what's happening in our nation. We're see, seeing what's happening within our government. And so we have to pray. We have to pray that people will do the right thing, the right and the righteous thing. Um, I know that many people were talking about the debate that happened between Raphael Warnock and Herschel Walker. Some people said it wasn't a debate. It was a debacle. Whatever the case is, and finally, he agreed to debate Raphael Warnock, and so we're uh, we're so glad about that. And I'm concerned about people who are <laughs> holding on to Herschel Walker for I'm sure it's for multiple reasons. And there are some things that we probably need to talk about at a later time and later date. But I know that progressive Christianity could make a difference in that particular region. And on those particular subject matters, right? Pro progressive Christianity. And so that's why we need to have these conversations. Voting is coming up. I see you, San Diego, California. Eric, God bless you. You know, voting is coming up. And it is a very, very important election, uh, particularly in Atlanta, right? Particularly in Atlanta, uh, Georgia. And, and, and uh, we also know that Stacey, Stacey Abrams is running for governor. Uh, and I know that. Uh, people like Bishop Alex Sonia, people uh, like David Alexander, Centers for Spiritual Living, and other churches, uh, Rehoboth Church of Atlanta, they've been trying, Bishop Alex Troy, they've been trying to hold it down uh, uh, in terms of uh, getting people out to vote and letting people know what it is that they need to do to uh, indeed move us forward. Every vote counts. So if you know people that are in the Georgia area, you have relatives, you have friends, we want you to encourage them to get out and vote. They need a connection. We have churches there, right? We have churches there. There are UCC churches there as well. I think it's the uh, sub Southeast Conference of the United Church of Christ. That We have churches that are there. If you need help, if you need direction, whatever it is that you need in terms of voters registration, in terms of, of voting, in terms of trying to get there, make a connection uh, with a local church. There are people that are deeply, deeply involved. And it is, uh, you know, in the terms of uh, what Asata Shakur said, it's our duty to fight and it's our duty to win. And so it is up to us to push forward Raphael, Senator Raphael Warnock. And it's up to us that live in the area to push forward Stacey Abrams. And I, I was looking at the polls and sometimes the numbers are the numbers, right? They don't really mean anything, but it's like a 1% margin or something like that. It's, 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 thank you so much. Southeast Conference of the United Church of Christ. Thank you, Bishop Alexonia. And so we want to encourage everyone to do what you can as it relates to voting, to make sure that uh, your vote counts. You know, if you have to, I know there's some kind of mail-in ballot that they have, you know, and uh, I want you all to, to be encouraged, to encourage other people that now is the time to speak up. Now is the time. And, uh, you know, somebody said we vote with our feet and we vote with our money. Well, this time you get to go down to the ballot box. And they'll probably try to do everything that they can to stop you from getting to the ballot box, right? But don't let anyone stop you from Georgia. I'm talking to Georgia. Don't let anybody stop you from casting your vote. Voting time is coming soon. I see you, Antonio J. Knox. Thank you for being on. I see you, Debbie Brown. Chicago is in the house. 
Uh, yeah, Macon, Georgia is here. Thank you so much. Yes, we want you to encourage your schoolmates, you know, your college kids, everybody to get out and vote. Our seniors, you know, whatever we can do to encourage you to do that. We want to make sure that that is happening on election day. Uh, people are um, really struggling. There's, it's, it's a very, very tight race, particularly between uh, Stacy and Brian. And I'm just hoping that uh, everybody would put forth their best effort in going down to vote. Um, yes, somebody, thank you, BJ. Vote as if your life depends on it. Because the fact of the matter is that it does depend on it. It does depend on it. These races are important. It's not just the presidential race that's important, but they're important on every single level. And so we have to be a part of what is happening. We have to be a part of the movement. And we can't get discouraged when things don't necessarily go our way. We still have to keep pressing and pushing forward right? And making our voices heard. How do we make them heard at the ballot box? We want to change Congress. We want to make sure that January 6th never happens again, that there's never an insurrection in our country. There's never people that uh, will try to overturn the government that we have created, right? And so it is up to us to do what we need to do. Yes, our vote counts. I see you, Louis Carlos Knox. God bless you. Voting like our lives are at stake because they are, right? And so I know that, I mean, I encourage our young people and I know that our young people, our millennials are going to turn out. They are ready for change. We are ready for change. And so uh, we support Georgia and whatever we can do from whatever our local states are, we want to make sure that we can do those things to make sure the vote is getting out. So let me go on. I see you, Diane Bobbitt. Thank you so much, Minister Bobbitt, Dinah Chapman. Vote, vote, vote. I want y'all to make sure everybody put it in your chats and your comment section. Vote, 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 vote. Let's do that. Let's move on with this conversation on tonight. Uh, we, we, we know that it's going to be a rich conversation. And so we look forward to having this conversation on tonight. Tonight, we have Reverend Dr. John C. Dorhauer. He is the general minister and president of the United Church of Christ. And we have Reverend Darrell Goodwin. He's the executive conference minister for the Southern New England Conference of the United Church of Christ. And so we want to bring them both in on tonight. Bishop Flunder will be in with us shortly. Thank you so much, Dr. Dorhauer. Thank you so much, Reverend Darrell Goodwin. It is a pleasure to have you both here with us tonight. Well, Bishop-elect, it's a true honor to be here, and especially with my dear friend, Darrell. So happy to be here. Awesome. And so Bishop Flunder is here, and we uh, certainly, she doesn't need an introduction, but we will introduce her. She's the presiding prelate of the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries and the senior pastor of City of Refuge United Church of Christ in Oakland, California, for the last 30 years. And so Bishop Flunder is here. We're so happy to have her on tonight. I see you, Deacon Ryan. Uh, yeah, early voting going on in, in Ohio. Yes, everybody is doing what they're supposed to do. This is so important. God bless you tonight. Bishop Flunder, how are you? <laughs> so this is a dangerous crowd right here. This is a dangerous <laughs> crowd. This is a this dangerous This is crowd. a danger. This is a world-changing moment right here. This is a world-changing moment. Yes, We're so it very is. glad to have both of these gentlemen here with us yes. on tonight and to engage in this conversation. Yes, yes, uh, yes. Uh, for such a time as this. For, for such a time as this. For such a time as this. This is the time to have this conversation around progressive uh, Christianity in, in endemic times. Yes. So we've moved past the pandemic into endemic times. And so we're so glad to have you here. And so, uh, Bishop Flender, if you would talk a little bit um, and try to frame this conversation for us tonight, that would be wonderful. Well, I'm very grateful to be uh, in the presence of these brothers and, and sons. Uh, how wonderful it is, how good and how pleasant it is to dwell together in unity. I, I am very grateful because we have uh, traveled together on many paths. Uh, we have experienced together uh, the 
realities of the time that we live in, all of the things that have been uh, consumed and regurgitated by bad religion. Uh, we have had to, together and separately, and then together again in some ways, speak into this atmosphere what God does require, what does God require, but that we do justice and love mercy and walk humbly before God. I got a phone call a couple nights ago, again at, at midnight from Bishop William Barber. You know, he likes to call me. Uh, either we'll call it late night or faux day, as my grandmother used to call it, faux day in the morning. But we were having a conversation um, about a text of scripture that um, I used a couple times in the recent past. Um, they that wait upon God will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They will run, not be weary. They will walk and they won't faint. They won't grow faint. And I told him, I said, uh, when we were preaching last time I was at Spelman a few days ago, I said that the order seems to be inappropriate. It seems as though you don't uh, work your way up in that direction. If you work your way up, you're supposed to walk. Then you're supposed to run. And then you're supposed to fly. But <laughs> that writer said, you fly, then you walk, rather, then you run, and then you walk. And, and something came alive in me. And that is the importance of our conversation tonight. And that is that to move from flying to running to walking suggests that what is most important is that we slow our roll enough to make the kinds of changes that we have to make that will be long-term and sustainable. The atmosphere that we are in and the toxicity of this atmosphere that we are in suggests that we have these knee-jerk reactions. Every day in the news is trying to give you a knee-jerk reaction over against planning something that is long-term and sustainable. That is in my heart because we, as people of color, as same gender loving people and as justice people and as women have endured all of what we're enduring in some ways prior to this time. It, then it looks better and then we thank God and we take a rest and we take a break. And the next thing you know, as I say often, the cicadas start creeping up from out of the ground and here we go again. I am hoping that we are looking at what it takes, not just to fly, not just to run, but what will it be like for us to walk together, as the old saints said, walk together children, and don't you get weary. What is that message to the church? What is the real systemic change that will be long lasting and sustainable? So I got some folks with us tonight that can spend some time with us, Bishop-elect Vanessa, to speak into us what they vision in and around that. God bless you both. You know how much I love you. Let's, let's chat, amen. Thank you so much, Bishop Flunder. For those of you that are just joining, uh, this conversation is for such a time as this, the relevance of the progressive church in endemic times, the relevance of the progressive church in endemic times. We have Dr. John Dorhauer here with us, as well as Reverend Darrell Goodwin, and of course, Bishop Flunder. And so my first question to all three of you uh, is, what is the difference in your opinion between the pandemic church and the endemic church. And so I'm going to start with Reverend Darrell Goodwin. I had a feeling that you were going to do that. <laughs> Let me um, start with a scripture, Bishop, as you were talking about that, this scripture that I preached on Sunday, but you gave me a different lens. So I might have to preach it again. <laughs> um, it's Galatians, the third chapter and the 22nd verse. And I want to read the NIV, which starts like this. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. Locked up <laughs> until the faith that was to come would be revealed. I think pre this moment, um, pre the pandemic, in many ways, the church writ large was locked up. 
we were locked up in the tradition of our liturgy, mm -hmm. locked up in the tradition of what could and could not occur, locked up um, with all of these sort of ritualistic understandings of what God could be, what church could be, what faith could look like. And I think the difference now is some churches or some progressive movements have sort of accepted the faith that is to come. Others are at least asking the question, why have we always, quote, done it this way? Why do we have to do it this way? I think some of the things that we're wrestling with in this hour were not questions we could have wrestled with in the context of the United Church of Christ, the, let's say the head deacon in some instances or the moderator. We have churches in the Southern New England Conference whose moderator lives in Chicago, who has never physically stepped foot in one of these buildings. They've only attended the church virtually, always attended the Bible studies, been a part of everything, all virtually. Now, one day, maybe they'll fly out here and be able to walk in the doors. But their understanding of leadership has been transformed because somebody got the key and that which was locked can now be opened. That was so good. Uh, you you asked that question why, and I'm going to let John and Bishop Flunt, Dr. Dohauer and Bishop Flunt to answer the question, but I wanted to say something that you said, Reverend Durrell, in terms of why do we always do things the same way? And I remember a preacher preaching a message, and he told a story of, uh, a, woman, of, of a woman who cooked a piece of ham, and the son would always say, the daughter would say, Mom, how come you always cut this piece of the ham off. And she would say, I don't know, my mother did it. And so that's what we're gonna do. And then, so they asked, she said, we should ask grandma. And grandma said, I don't know, my mother did it. I mean, you know, we can ask mother. And so we they asked the great grandmother, she said, because my stove was too small to fit the whole ham. Right. And so for all of these years, they have been doing things a particular way, but not no real rhyme or reason to it and actually wasting a good piece of meat. And so. <laughs> Dr. Dor Howard. What a perfect story, Bishop elect, to tell, to analogize the state of the church. One of the things that I'll talk about in terms of pandemic versus endemic, the church prior to the pandemic had proven over a couple of decades its resistance to trust the Holy Spirit and the changes that she was asking for the church to birth with her. And then the pandemic hit and we came, we became a church uh, that heretofore I would characterize as resistant to a church that immediately entered into a state of fear. That when the pandemic hit and we thought about uh, no longer gathering in person, there was this panic reaction. The church is, is now going to die. Our members are going to disappear. Their dollars and contributions are going to dry up and there's no recovering from this. And the longer it lasted, the, uh, the, the deeper we entrenched in that fear until we started experiencing something that we didn't anticipate. And I'll get to that in a second. Rather than introduce at this point a scripture verse, I want to talk about the, the, the language of two saints that I came to know early on that I relied on every day of the pandemic. And one was Julian of Norwich, who in the midst of her own pandemic uttered these words of faith, having sat at the bedside of loved one after loved one after loved one who had died, and through the eyes of faith said, all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. And then the second word that I want to rely on are the words that were written to me by a, a pastor that I have come to know and cherish in the United Reformed Church of Great Britain. His name is Nigel Uden. And Nigel wrote to me to talk about the church in Cambridge. Um, and Coventry. Um, and in particular, and he serves the church in Cambridge, but he wanted to, to share with me the story of the church in Coventry, which was carpet bombed by the Germans in the Second World War, and the cathedral just literally lay in ruins. And as a young pastor in 1939, about a year after the bombing and the, the ruination of the city, 
and the structure of that church was being invited to serve that congregation and trying to discern whether or not he wanted to, one of the deacons said to the pastor these words, and these are the words that Nigel shared with me. There is no change that this church cannot endure so long as the gospel is preached and the kingdom proclaimed. And, and that really became what the church characterized by resistance prior to the pandemic, characterized by fear early in the pandemic, came to realize there is no change the church cannot live through and survive so long as the gospel is preached in the kingdom proclaimed. And that's what we did. We may have done it in ways that we had never done before, in which most of our clergy had been prepared for or taught how to do, but we all entered these virtual spaces with the fear that it was going to shut us down, only to realize we're getting more people showing up in these virtual places than we were getting in the physical places, only to realize, as Darrell said, that folk were coming into our worship communities who would, would never and had never set foot in our physical spaces. And we began to realize, more important than any of that, that even in these virtual places, the Holy Spirit has the capacity to be present and affect the hearts and minds and lives of those who gather in those spaces. And that's the endemic community. It's leaving the pandemic, looking back and saying, oh my gosh, what just happened? And why were we so afraid? And why were we so resistant? And what's it going to mean now to trust the work of the Holy Spirit and embrace this new birthing? That's excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to read a comment before Bishop Flunder uh, comments. It says, this is Bishop Alexonia. Now the church must stop trying to commandeer the judgment seat and humble themselves enough to sit on the mercy seat. Mm. I love that. Bishop Flinders. Yeah. Well, that's almost altar call talk right there. That's <laughs> <laughs> um, here's, here's what I hope that we learn. Um, because we, this is not the first. This is the newest in many reformations that we have experienced. Thanks be to God for multiple reformations. Imagine what we would still be doing if, if, if we had not you know, and the, I think the question that I have is, are we ready to use this particular reformation or enter into this particular reformation with the intention of really first hearing the voice of God in good and of really creating systemic change? And I know that I have, there's, there's a way that the spirit of God in, works in me sometimes to radicalize things. And I'm, I'm clear about that. I'm very, I'm very clear again, that we need a new canon. Um, I'm very clear about that. And there are people that, that get, Preach it. Preach. Yeah, they, you know what I mean? They get real upset with me when I say it, but I tell them that in one of the other many reformations, a group of people said something is missing and we need to do more with what we have. And we have too many great writers, some we've already echoed their writings, that in some way those writings need to be pulled together. And in some way we need to do whatever we need to do to sanctify those writings and so that the people of our future will not lose some of what is the writings of the pandemic. Because this has been an incredible time of both writing and reading and putting things together that speak to the time that we are in. So I think this is the Third Testament moment. I think it is that reformation, frankly. I think that it is also offering us an, a time to take a good hard look at why we do what we do. And a beautiful denomination, organization like the United Church of Christ, which is new and young compared to, as it relates to others, right? I think we already have reached the point that we are doing things and we're not altogether sure why we do <laughs> what we do the way we do. And that means that we are at least middle-aged. Okay? <laughs> because it's at middle age when you just start doing stuff because that's just the way, like, like Bishop Lake Vanessa was saying, that's just the way that we do how we do. 
what we do. And I'm very happy to be a part of the United Church of Christ, but I don't have any trouble reminding us that I almost didn't make it. Almost. I was one vote shy of the Committee on Ministry A, and I never would have made it. One more person had decided that my emergence from my method Baptocostal experience, you know, that the, the prophetic call to liberate the people most marginalized by church and society, the ways in which my congregation cared for me and I cared for them. There were folks that said that they just couldn't, they wouldn't, and I couldn't. And that was basically but one vote off. So the, the question that I ask, and I ask now, Let's take a good hard look at why we do what we do and not reach middle age such that we are unable to make the shifts that these times call for and make them gently so that they are also not concretized. Yep. If we leave open enough room and space on the playground, as somebody said to me, we were talking about children and gender. I said to them, put a bunch of toys in the middle of the playground and let the children go for what intrigues them. Don't tell them that these, the pink toys are the girl toys and the blue toys are the boy toys. Just let them go and grab what blesses them and let's see what comes of it, right? I think that we are old enough as a denomination, all of us are part of that, but we are also citizens of the will of the divine in a more broad and universal way. And we have an eye on that and a heart for that, right? So I think it is good for us to be good with being different. I think that's a, I think it's a good thing, not just so much because we want to show off our differentness. But I think that the more we push back against concretized systems, the more we have learned from this endemic moment, from this pandemic endemic moment. And finally this, um, I don't think that we really smell enough of the, the stench of time because it doesn't take long to get stuck. It really does not. It is amazing. And, and I have to say, again, it went slow. Time went slow for me when I was 15, 20. Come on now. Oh, yeah. When do uh, you remember when time was slow? I Early. do, when summer seemed to last forever. <laughs> do you remember that, Doc? Now do summer's over and it's gone, and it's October. Somebody says, we're not going to do so-and-so until next year. And two weeks later, it's next it's year. next year. And nobody thought that I, was going to happen. twice, and my son graduated from college. Do you see? Very and it's getting worse and so. worse over time, right? And then we begin to feel that, well, I'm just going to get in it and ride it. And we forget that we are called to be change agents. So, yes, yeah. I'm in with this. We are in a full on reformation. So I, a full on reformation. Yeah. I'm so inspired by what you say here. And I want to reflect for just a moment on that one vote. Right. That one vote. First of all, that's all the Holy Spirit needed. To, to birth something new on the other side of it that prior to that one vote meant almost literally from the birth of Christianity until that moment, all of the identities that you embody and represent were permitted to articulate themselves fully as a gift to the body of Christ. And the number of people before you who presented themselves to the body who never got the one vote needed to, to be present. And all you and all the Holy Spirit needed was that one vote. Earlier this week, I, I wrote to a pastor um, who had just given birth to her first child a few months ago. And I said, tell me about motherhood. And she started talking about 
both the pain of being a mother in a culture and a church still fully ensconced in patriarchal ways, right? But, but then she talked about everything that she had learned and experienced and embodied and grew in her understanding of faith and, and the practice of ministry because of being a mother and how prior to just a couple of generations ago, the church was never given the opportunity to articulate itself fully through the lens of those who experience motherhood. And, and Durrell just talked about showing up in a congregation celebrating a 300th anniversary and saying, you know, when you were founded, I would not have been your conference minister and this woman would not have been your pastor. And the Holy Spirit is just looking for those, whatever it takes for the entire body now to be called into leadership. And the last thing I want to say about this, we are, I think, finally reaching the point where we are ready to outlive and cast off the skin of white male heteronormative orthodoxy and the faith and church that it built and permitted to exist. And this isn't, and in, 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 yes, it is a reform movement in the way that you've described it. Bishop, but it's also not a reform movement because the reform movement asks, what do we need to change to make what we have better? When I think what the Holy Spirit is calling for is a complete rebirth articulated for the first time through the lens of the full panoply of voices and bodies and experiences that will allow for a whole new church to emerge in this time. You know, one of the things that I was thinking through is a couple of quick stories. The first one is on my bookshelf, there are a number of um, manuals I want to own. Some of them are my great grandmother's manuals from when she was a mother of the church <laughs> when I was growing up. So that's the 40s, 50s on. And <laughs> then I have the Church of God in Christ manual because I grew up Church of God in Christ. And I thought maybe keep it. Then I have the congregational manual before the United Church of Christ came into existence from a, a local church pastor who passed away and his wife gifted it to me. And then I have the current United Church of Christ manual. What I think is beautiful is that for such a time as this, each and every one of those documents still have value, but they've become antiquated immediately. <laughs> there are things we can take from them but every one of them can't speak to what God is doing exactly right now. <laughs> I, I name it because as institution, the church, we depend on these kind of documents. And there is a wrestling, if it doesn't happen in the spirit, which we hope it will, it happens in how we're orchestrated when the documents on which we've built history and time begin to no longer speak to time. And so I feel like there is a movement because those things have to be rewritten. We have to understand how you go through an ordination process when people can't be gathered in the same space. We have to figure out what authorization looks like when I couldn't travel three states across and I was living in a different place. Everything in which we've constructed ourselves, I think is going through this rippling of trying to ask ourselves, what do we do? So you start with your manuals, your documents, okay? Then I think to your point, John, it begins to ask, well, who sits at the table of decision-making? And I think the pandemic pushed a question, not just in the United Church of Christ, but I think in other social service organizations and business organizations and state organizations and our government to ask who is sitting at this seat. And I think people not only wanted what has always been business as usual, but they were looking for this prophetic, spiritual, charismatic, energetic, and racially and gender diverse leadership that I think now is looking at those manuals, declaring in what ways they no longer apply, asking how can their own voices now begin to shape what is to come. And then the buildings and the spaces, which would have been the other hindrance, the pandemic has also asked us, can we maintain these things? Why are we doing it in those same ways? Actually, we've traversed beyond them. Maybe these spaces now need to become community centers and yoga studios, and we also will worship in them. I think those three things together, change your documents, change your leadership, change the institutional space. 
synergistically, every one of those things is happening, not only in the UCC, but I think all over our world. My prayer is that those three things, and many, many more, but let's pick on those three things, happening synergistically will compel us not to go back into the locked situation that I talked about in the scripture earlier. That's where I have hope. That's where I have joy. That's where I see fruition. I did name to this church on Sunday that was celebrating 300 years. 300 years ago, I would not have been elected as the conference minister of the Southern New England Conference, our largest conference. I'll be honest with you. I also wouldn't have been elected in 2019. There was something about 2020 and the desire to seek something that was not what has been that has allowed this moment and it's happening all around us. The last time I was with you two and Bishop elect, you were there as well, but with you, uh, John, and with you, Bishop, we it was 2019 sitting at the, the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries gathering, talking about the future of the church yeah. and what it could be. And here we are now. Wow. And look how much that we couldn't even see maybe at that moment that's nigh us even now. <laughs> In this conversation and what now the Holy Spirit has done, that's how fast these things change when we are compelled. John, you pulled forth a, 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 a congregational model when you talked about everybody reimagining, right? Reimagining, repurposing, reconstituting uh, what the church could be, right? Rebirthing what the church could be. That's a question that's being asked, as Reverend Durrell said, all over the world. I was in Berlin and they are asking yep. those same questions mm -hmm. in their churches, right? What do we do at our building? People are not coming. Yep. So what? So maybe it's not bringing people into the building. Maybe it's us coming out of the building to where the people are, right? And so yeah. I think that this is an ongoing conversation that's being had multiple times on multiple levels and multiple spaces and places. And like Darrell just said, we could have, you know, uh, yeah, we could still have church here, but we got, to, we have to do something else with this space. How can we repurpose this space? Yes. It's yoga. Yes. It's a community center. Yes. It's all of these things. And Bishop Flinder can even speak more to that because her building is actually doing it. I thank you so much. And you, you all are making me think about so many things. Thank God for this, you know, and I trust that all the folks that are listening to us are also listening with your hearts and with your experience, because in the wind of the spirit moves, it moves everywhere. That's the beautiful thing about the wind of the spirit. And, um, and yes, um, mega has got to get a new name. What does it mean to have a mega church or a mega denomination, right? Uh, and if mega means all of the people who name being a part of one institution, one church, one denomination, um, they all wear the same color on first Sunday. You know what? You understand what I mean? If that is what <laughs> mega is, I think that we have moved beyond that. I don't even believe that Jesus intended that we be that way. And, and it perpetuates Jesus the mythology that bigger is better. Exactly. And Jesus being at the little house churches, you understand what I'm saying, and, and walking the disciples around. Let's talk about what he really did. That's before we put Prada shoes on him. You know what I mean? What he <laughs> what he really did, what, what it was really like for him. So, so mega has to get a new meaning and folks have to stop desiring to have massively large social clubs um, and seeing what it is to help people become and to help them launch and then to be, to bless them as they go. And maybe they'll turn around and say, thank you, or maybe they won't. But the important piece is that you can bless them as they go and grow and glow and whatever it is that is a part of their what's next. And I'm left with this idea. Um, I'm a birth mother. I may be the only, I think I'm the only one on this broadcast in terms of face to face as I'm looking. Okay. And I can tell you one peculiarity about giving birth. And that is, it's a mess. Let's start with that. 
<laughs> when I tell you that that thing is a mess, and anybody that's listening to me and us tonight, and you know it's a mess, just put in the chat, it's a mess. So that folks will know that we know it's a mess. It's a mess. You just all toe up. You toe up, and your hair's all toe up, and your clothes all toe up, and you don't feel good. You're miserable, and, you, and you're miserable. And people that say things like, calm down. Come breathe. All right. And you'll be okay. You're going to get through this. You want to punch him in the throat because that's the way it's just a mess. But the great miracle that I'd like to lift up is that after you have given birth and you see the little package and you hold the little package and the little package makes its, its effort to get to your breasts. It is amazing how the struggle somehow or other leaves your memory hmm. because the beauty and the, 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 the warmth, the, I, it's hard for me to even find words. It's just, it, and for many of us who are birth mothers, it makes you weep because the, it's just the most wonderful thing in that moment, what that feels like in that moment. And you toe up. I mean, as Ofo said, from the floor up, you are not your best and highest self in that moment, I can tell you. But what I also can tell you is that for reasons that I cannot comprehend, when I try to remember the pain of it, I can barely recall. Wow. And I think that there are a lot of other birth mothers and birth fathers who have given birth to something, some plan, some vision that somehow or other, the struggle to get there just doesn't stick with you. What, what is the beauty is the birth. If I could say anything to the church, to our church and to the churches that we are called to. We are in the birthing room. And, and you know what they told me? Push. And they just kept saying it. Push, push. Yvette, you have got to push because you're about to give birth. There was any message that I could really offer right now to us as a denomination and to all of those who are concerned with what it is that God and good is doing in this moment, we're going to have to push and push and push and push until what is the real purpose for this time really comes to pass. And it will as God lives <laughs> This is the reformation for this time. And I bless God every time I see, again, some little feet and some little fingers, you know, some indication that something powerful this way comes. God bless you. That's beautiful. You know, I was reflecting last year when so many of our churches were worshiping virtually. And I would often get the question, Reverend Goodwin, what should our first Sunday back look like? And it became curious how many churches would ask this <laughs> in the coffee hour on virtual on the Zoom. I had the same answer. I said, first Sunday should look like you closing off the street and inviting the community to a barbecue and celebrating with one another and feeding folks and allowing people to bring their gifts and having conversations about how the inside will never look like it looked again. I think we have this compelling invitation to not run back, but to run out. Not just say, well, this for such a time as this, we did this thing because we had to, but that folks might say something transformed. As a local church pastor, I often would say, I want the type of church in the future, and I was a church start pastor, that doesn't look like anything that I created. <laughs> and what I meant by that is that revelation might have revealed itself, that new things might have occurred, that somebody might have seen Jesus more brighter than I could have seen it in this moment. I think if the church can posture itself 
with a, it ought to be greater. It ought to burn brighter. We ought to get out more. That's to me, Bishop, the push, the push to say, never again can we stay stagnant. Every new iteration of this should ought to be stretching us towards something greater. I think that to me, and it doesn't eclipse us, right? We've done the work, every one of us. <laughs> has founded churches, pastored churches, led things. Glory be to God for what he's done. But those who are coming now and those who come in the future ought to do greater. It ought to be brighter. Things ought to be renewed in ways that not one of us here in this moment could even imagine. If it doesn't do that, then I think we didn't push. We just went back in the doors, locked them again, and waited for another, quote, reformation. <laughs> And Bishop, you say you have to be raggedy to give birth. Say more about that. <laughs> it's not cute. <laughs> that's, I, that's what I hear uh, Reverend, Reverend Goodwin saying. It's not cute. You know, if we're not used to receiving everybody, we're, we, it terrifies us. We're afraid that we're going to say something wrong. You know, we'll make the black people mad or we'll make the women mad or we'll make the gay folks mad. <laughs> We're going to make the gay people going to be hostile. You know, it's raggedy. It is raggedy. But that is necessary. And you know, I just came from Chicago. Bishop Lake Vanessa was with me. We were there for a week. And when people came to talk to us after the sermon moment, as their, their, as their uh, pastor, pastor in residence for a week, came to talk to us about this, the service moment, they were very apprehensive because they didn't want to say anything to my female, same gender loving African-American self that might upset me, if you understand. And, and, and they were very cautious. And sometimes in the middle of the conversation, they, and, and Bishop Black Vanessa was with me, they would break and weep. And, and I would break and we would, the, the, Communication then went from trying to be politically correct to shedding tears together. And, and that's what I mean. I, that's what I hear Reverend Durrell saying. Raggedy. It's, it, it's, we can't really spend a lot of time trying to be unnecessarily careful. Because <laughs> you can't speak my language. And you've heard me say it many times, you don't understand chitlins. You can't, you can't speak my language because if you never walked a mile in my shoes and I've never walked a mile in yours, how are we really, but that's not, that is not the foundational principle of love. Love suffereth long and is kind. Doesn't envy. It does. You know, that's love is a very different concept than just being precious and sweet. If you understand what I'm saying, it's much deeper than okay. I said that. So, Bishop, what occurs to me as you speak into the the air here, the air that we breathe, you can't speak my words, you can't speak my language, is that what we've inherited is both a culture and a church where the white man believed that was exactly what he had the right to do. And to force his language on you and to take your language out of your mouth and replace it with his, which is why the spirit is calling for the birthing of a new church where every voice, every voice can be honored and heard. And in the articulation of, and in the receiving of that voice, allow others who don't speak that language to be transformed by it and because of it, so that we all impact one another as children of the living God. And that is such, what a beautiful way to articulate that. You cannot speak my language. We we have a, thank you so much, Bishop Flunder, Dr. Dorhauer and Reverend Durrell. We have a question on the floor from one of the audience members. And they said, with the churches that have closed due to pan the pandemic and have their buildings sitting, what would you say to those dry bones, especially when you're not part of the denomination? And any one of you all can take, or all of you all can answer. Oh, go ahead, John. 
you first. Well, I was just going to say, um, I posted a, a link to something called the Resiliency Project, which is a project we did in the Southern New England Conference, which is a series of interviews of churches who literally wrestled with this question during the pandemic. And it gives a myriad of examples of what those churches did. So I was sort of pulling out the yoga studios and the art collectives and all of this, because that's how those churches chose to sort of blow back into the dry bones. One of the things I'm asking every church to think about right now is three Bs, and I'll give you one for free. Be relevant. I think that's the question that every faith community, every organization has to ask itself. How do we be relevant? And being relevant means asking the community in which you are situated, how can we partner to walk alongside each other? And so if the community needs a daycare, then the building becomes a daycare. If the community needs a concert hall, then the church becomes the concert. You become that thing which is needed to be relevant. And I think that's the question that sometimes the church has taken sort of a, a, a look away at. If we just simply ask that, now it's going to be uncomfortable because don't ask it. <laughs> it says, don't call on the name of the Lord because God will come as a refiner's fire and a fuller soap. If we ask the community, how can we as a faith community be relevant? I think we'll get very uncomfortable with the answer, but it will breathe the dry will breathe, breathe the spirit back into the dry bones, which at this moment is a lot of buildings all over this country, for example, be relevant. The, the, the beauty of answering that question at a time like this is there is now a, a growing list, a large growing list of churches who are doing exactly what Darrell just described, who are repurposing their buildings as a as stewards of the resources entrusted to them for the sake of a mission they believe in. And if we're to borrow Dur Durrell's language here, mission that's relevant to the community in which they're located. And so one of the ways to respond to this is just to talk about what some of those communities are already doing. Uh, a church in Memphis, Tennessee, that now has 33 community mission organizations housed in their building and property. And I'm not going to talk about all 33 of them, but my two favorite are a, a young man from the neighborhood who goes around and collects discarded bicycles and has this entire empty basement now filled with old discarded bike parks and then works with children in the neighborhood to put the pieces together to build a bike that they get to take home with them. Um, and a second ministry uh, run by a woman who teaches belly dancing, Middle Eastern woman, only to women who have been sexually abused or assaulted as a way of, a way of reclaiming their bodies as sacred and using their bodies to articulate their emotions and feelings in ways that they claim as their own. That's an example. There's uh, St. Uh, Peters in Louisville, Kentucky, James Etta Ferguson, the pastor, who turned their empty, unused parking lot into a strip mall in the poorest part of the zip code, where for 25, 30 years, no business had chosen to move and got the Chamber of Commerce and the city of Louisville and the state of Kentucky and even some federal dollars to help fund this and has changed the economic outlook. And now the city of Louisville doesn't want that church to die, sees it as an historic and, and essential part of the community and is granting the church two and a half million dollars to restore their sanctuary so that it can come to life again. And, and they're, it's sort of in a very organic way, they're feeding each other. And we could spend the rest of the evening listing examples of churches that are doing this. But it is about becoming relevant, and it is about understanding the building, not as the end in itself, but only as a resource that you steward for the sake of a mission that makes you relevant in the community. John, I just want to quickly lift up. I went to a church last week in Cleveland, uh, well, a former church, um, a church that was bought out by a refugee resettlement community. And the women from all these countries who are refugees are making candles 
with scents from their native country. Yes. And let me tell you, some of the best smelling candles <laughs> I've ever had in my life. But the point was, it wasn't just about let's use the building to co-opt somebody else's culture and make them do the thing that we want them to do. But these women now have learned a skill they're bringing sense from their own cultural heritage, and then they will make the profits off of them. Yeah. So they got their own candle making build, business of essences of their culture. And I think these are the kind of ways in which if you want to talk about renewal, that's that church saying, nobody's yeah. here. We're not using this building, but we can gift it. That's and beautiful. our community is filling that up. And it's right down the street. I'll send you the address. I, just to I'd sure love to be down and them. <laughs> we have churches that are using taking parts of unused parts of their property yes. and converting them to community gardens and having the community come in. And, and, and we're talking about places in what are now recognized as food deserts yes. and the community is planting and nurturing and, and, and the church is converting their property into now a, a, a renewable asset for the community. So many things. See, this is something I understand, as you as you know, well, you know my heart, you know, this is something that I understand. But and and in so many ways has been the life of City of Refuge and and, and it has been the life of City of Refuge because we are ex an exiled people. And when you I believe this, I believe that when you are an exiled people as, as women leaders, as LGBT people, as people of African descent in, the, in terms of primary numbers, it's not all we are, but it is a goodly portion of, of who we are. There's something that can open you up to the needs of other people uh, because as, as one old missionary, she was from uh, Philadelphia, uh, Reverend Duell, um from Bishop Taylor's church. And she came to city, city of Refuge when we first started over in San Francisco in the little room that we were in. And she came and she put me to the side. She said, now leave it. That's the way she said it. She said, God ain't gonna give you yours like God gives it to other people. Mm. That's not the way you're gonna get it. That's what she told me. <laughs> I said, so tell me more. God ain't gonna give it to himself. <laughs> but in my heart, I understood that what she was saying to me, don't even try to go down that path because that's not the path. So I would say to those that are hearing us tonight, imagine the church having clear glass walls. What does that mean? So that you can truly see what is in the community and where the needs are that have been expressed here tonight in types of things to do. But the, the community can clearly see you so that we move beyond this private, you know, special club with, with Bible verses, that we move beyond that to being completely exposed in our humanity and our needs and then having people feel free to completely expose themselves to us so synergistically we can serve one another. It's not just about us serving them, because I, I hear that. But it also includes them serving us, them being a part of increasing and improving and in helping us that are a part of the inside of the church. Because God in heaven knows we need help too in several different ways. And I'll also say this. Someone asked me the question the other day. We were having this conversation about all of the pomp and circumstance that happened around the memorials when Queen, when Queen Elizabeth died. And it was incredible. And the pageantry was just, it was just incredible. I'm just very glad that they just allow me to go ahead and say because I'll get, on, get in trouble. But I'm going to say it anyway. I'm just very glad they didn't invite Donald Trump because he'd have been fighting with somebody to get in the, in the Queen's coach. But anyway, I think that what, it, what is important is the beauty of it. It was incredible how they loved her, even the ones that didn't loved her, love her, loved the pageantry and everything that was surrounding it. But in the middle of all of that beauty were those significant blood diamonds that were in her crown 
and in the jewelry that the women in the family wore that were a part of the blood diamonds. Right. They were taken from the possessions of Great Britain. The sun never sets on England. The sun never sets on Great Britain because of all of the ways in which Great Britain has taken from all of the places where it has been, right? These little islands taken from all of the places where it has been. What I would have loved to see at the end of all of that pageantry would have been the royal family saying outright that we are going to return the value of these stones or the stones themselves to the people that they were taken from. Hmm. Because we are going to be a different place, a different place than we have ever been before. Right. Let's say that as the church, we are going to see the value of those that have been wounded by the church. And we are going to be different. We are going to be different than we have ever been before. The second, second thing I offer to be relevant, the second part that I offer is be transformed and be transformative. And Bishop, you just said that so beautifully. Be transformed. Is the quote church willing to be transformed. So if you ask the community again, how can we be relevant? Are you willing as a body to then be transformed? And I say the be transformed before you be transformative because we love being transformative. <laughs> you know, we collected the 150 sleeping bags for those who are without homes. We gave, we brought the turkeys. It's about to be Thanksgiving. You know, we can do all, but what happens systemically to ask, why do we need to give turkeys? what's happening with food insecurity in the town or the city in which we live that causes the need for families to not be able to have food on the table. That's when we say we're willing to be transformed. Well, this is Desmond Tutu because this is Bishop. He says, you know, it's great that we're pulling people out the water, but we need to find out what's causing people to be thrown in the yeah. water in the first place. Right. And so I think that those, that's, it's a lot of work to be done when we talk about progressive Christianity, uh, I, I think about many of the denominations who are currently at an impasse as it relates to how their ministries are going to continue to go forward, what their churches are going to do, you know, how, you know, people are going back to meeting, but people are not showing up, right? And it's not just one particular denomination that's having a problem with people returning back to service. And so now, now what do we do? Because things will never be the same again. We're not going back to the way things were. We could try, but it's going to be, you know, a lesson of futility. So what is, what do we need to do? Go ahead, Bishop. I don't want to go back. That's right. You know, my truth is I'm I'm just seeking the Lord. I've been listening, listening to the voice of God. So what is what's next? Because I believe that God will not desert us. I believe that we are in the wind of, of the spirit of God. We're in the wind of the spirit of God. And, and that's what's lifting our wings. I want to know what is it? And I want to have the courage to do it. What would you have us do? You know, I'm 67 and I think to myself that I hope I'm not too old for change because sometimes, you know, you, you just want to get in a recliner. You understand what I'm talking about in lay back. But, but there are some things that we are still called to do and some, some shifts and changes. And my truth, Bishop like Vanessa, is I really don't know except it's time to crawl up in God's lap and put our ear to God's heart. And listen, speak, Lord. Thy servant heareth. What is it? What is it? It's not the Barna's group's job to find it. I think that it is our <laughs> responsibility to put our ear, because nobody knew that we were going to have, even the big predictors did not know that the evangelical church was gonna lose his stone cold crazy mind. 
We didn't, we didn't, you know, we knew that they could turn into something, but we certainly didn't knew, know that they were going to get in bed with Donald Trump. Nobody would have been able to make me believe that. I think it's important to tell the truth That's by right. saying we don't know. We don't know. We, we don't, don't know. know. And our young people, our young people are asking the question. I know there is no, there can be no, you know, uh, uh, without young people, there can be no new growth. And they if don't know don't have any young people. They don't know. So They're trying know, to know. what are they doing? All the young people in my life, they doing brunch. <laughs> That's what they're doing. Brunch or something. With Cross little shit. music here and there. Yeah. And you know what I'm saying? And with some Bellinis and some, you know, whatever it is, they, they are having brunch on Sundays. They so did Jesus. So, so can we just go <laughs> to the brunch? That's and good wine. Don't forget that. <laughs> brunch and good wine. <laughs> that was the Sunday afternoon for Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you say what's next. I, I think my little last B would be be prophetic. And what I think it means is can we envision a future that's beyond ourselves? I'm going to get in trouble for this. My future I see a combined UCC, MCC, DOC, TFAM, all of it. I see stopping the boundaries and the, the brocades we've put up and all of that. I think if you're going to do something to change the world and you all want to try to do it together, <laughs> you better band together. Because what, I, what you talked about in terms of this other rhetoric yeah. is people have merged over hate and we can't merge over love. I mean, they've banded together millions of dollars to hate folk. And that we so squirrel in our piece and squirrel in this yeah, piece over great. here. Don't do that too much because I can't handle you doing this over here. I think it's time. I mean, the, prophetically, I think it's about asking, where can we blur the lines that we've never been willing to blur them? Where can we break open every single barrier that we've said? Okay, I will tell this quick thing. I was at a church recently where the pastor informed me, Reverend Goodwin, just please understand that people will not be dancing and clapping in the aisles this Sunday. <laughs> and I think yeah, that wasn't my intention necessarily, but okay. So I get to the church and I preach my sermon. And let me tell you, the Harvard trained pianist started playing a song that she hadn't planned to play. <laughs> And then people literally, and I, I kid you not, actually started clapping and dancing in the aisles. And now after the service, the Harvard trained pianist came to me to say, I'm sorry, Juilliard trained. She said, I don't know what happened to me. I just started, I just felt the song and I started playing it. And the pastor was weeping and didn't understand it. For me, it was the possibility that this congregational church might also find the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Like to me, that's breaking the barriers. That's saying Juilliard can teach me how to play a song that I didn't know that I had to play. It means that I can dance and clap in the aisles when I wasn't anticipating that. It also means that I can be reflective and contemplative and hold it prophetically if we get ourselves together. Hallelujah. <laughs> David oh, Alexander said, get ourselves together. <laughs> David Alexander said in some new thought as well, Reverend Darrell. He's ready. To come on, new God. thought. Come on, Dave. David, you know you and I. Come on. Yes. <laughs> he's a, he's a greater, greater coalitions. And, he's and, a Holy Ghost filled new thought preacher. Yes. That's what it is. I'm like, yes. and then, I've seen him dance. I want new thought people. David Alexander is a dancing new thought. <laughs> yes. And then That's someone right. said that it's time for progressive Christian denominations to come together. And they are 100% right. If they could come together like they did for Donald Trump, we can come together and do what we need to do for ourselves, progressive denominations. And it doesn't matter whose building it is. If your building is suffering, you know what I mean? The T Fam and the MCC church can come into a UCC church. UCC can come over to a T Fam church. It, it needs to be some kind of cross pollination happening uh, for the better of all of us. Right, our communities, our children, the future of our children, everyone. Yes, Bishop. And all the beats get in there, the two and the four and the one and the three, then all the clapping happens. Right. If, <laughs> if all of us, we can do this. We can. I love that. Well, yeah. You know, I pray for a, a, a mega convocation. I pray for a con convocation that brings all of the 
Even the Methodists that are looking for a home now. That's right. That brings all of the people who really have a heart for justice. Yeah. To come together in one, one large gathering and declare both with our presence. Yeah. With our preaching, with our praying, yes. with our money, that we are people of justice. I absolutely would love to see something powerful like that. I, I believe it can happen. Yes, we both said it. I think it's it's there. It's right. It's like right there, right? It just takes the takes the. Somebody says, Bishop Alexon, you said yes, Azusa three. It just takes the right minds to come together and say, Hey, we're going to do this. It doesn't matter who's on first, who's on second, who's on third. We're going to do this together, and this is how it's going to work, and this is what it's going to look like. So I am just incredibly excited about uh, the direction that we're going in. I'm going to ask that Dr. Dorhauer. Uh, Reverend Durrell and Bishop Flunder, give us last some last thoughts, some last things that you want to say around this conversation. Because I know that if we don't do it now, then we're going to lose our time. We're going to lose our momentum. It's not going to come again. And so this is it. This is the time. The time is now. Uh, Reverend Durrell? <laughs> I wanted wisdom to go before beauty. Okay, so I'm going to say the things I said earlier. I think the church at this moment is called to be relevant, to be transformed, and to be transformative, and to be prophetic. I want to serve in a church that has broken its walls, that has ended its barriers. We say we want that where there's a God didn't put a period, where there's a comma and all this, but we have to mean it. We have to mean that the epistles are still being written. We have to mean that the boxes no longer apply. We have to mean that God is greater than anything we could have ever imagined before and walk towards it. So alongside you, Bishop elect Brown and Bishop Funder and Reverend Dr. John, I want to walk into a Senate one day where we see the denominations come together and say, we will no longer, that they all may be one. I believe that was a prophetic statement that I hope will come to pass in our lifetime, not somebody else. I'm telling God, I want to enjoy that. <laughs> I'll end on that. Dr. Dorhauer. So I'll do two things real quick. The, the first is, I think we're fast approaching the time when denominations won't be what identify your walk of faith, that it will be whether or not you orient your faith along the axis of fear or the axis of love. And a faith that orients, sense, orients itself along the axis of fear is going to look a lot like the Christ, brand of Christian nationalism we see articulated now that looks at somebody different and and uh, is afraid of what they see and needs to shape their world in such a way that they're protected from that, as opposed to an orientation of love where you look at what's around you and articulate your gratitude to God for, for giving you the opportunity to be a part of this and see this and stand alongside of that. And I think by the end of the 21st century, we won't, we won't recognize Disciple or UCC or MCC or Fellowship. We'll recognize the difference between religion that orients itself along the axis of love and religion that orients itself along the axis of fear. And then the second thing I want to say is uh, there are three verbs that I use for the church as we're living through this season of change. The first is play. Uh, have a spirit of play about this. Um, there are things that somebody can do to harm the church, but there's nothing that you can do to break the church that the Holy Spirit can't renew and fix. So play. The second verb is fail. Be Take risks big enough that you're not guaranteed to get it right the first time. And if your risks aren't big enough that you're failing often, um, then take bigger risks uh, because the Holy Spirit needs us to break quickly out of these chains that have bound us for too long. So take big risk and be comfortable with your failures and learn from them. Fail often, fail quick. And then the third is hope. We live, we are living in and through a season 
of of pandemic. But the, the, there's a viral pandemic. There's a racial pandemic. There's a climate pandemic, and it can be really easy to just face all of that with a sense of hopelessness and despair. Um, but we don't live as those who have no hope. We are a resurrection people, and we can't stop looking, believing about the future that it's going to be better. Beautifully said, Dr. Dohauer. Yeah. Blunder. I, I want to have a Pentecostal run around the room, but I'm going I'm yeah. going to try to see if I might be able to remain okay in my box here. But let me say what I feel. Um, and Jesus asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? Right? And there were different, I'm sure, different murmurings and different things. I'm sure it was some things that the writers didn't write about that the people said about Jesus. I'm pretty sure about that. Who do who you say that I am? Thou, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, right? And then And then the response, then upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell and the gates of hell prevail. and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I think that what is failing is what it is that we are calling church is not church. <laughs> because the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. What we have to do is rediscover what is the church. If it is being destroyed, it is not the church. If it is not doing what it's supposed to do in this time, it is not the church. If it's not caring, for those who are the most disadvantaged, it is not the church. If it is not speaking truth to power with courage, it is not the church. Because the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. My heart says we need to rediscover what is the church and what are we about doing when we are being the church. Thank you so much, Bishop Flunder. I see your post, uh, Reverend Durrell. You said you invite any of you to come and grow with us in the Southern New England Conference. We have churches that need folks ready to chart what's next and you give a link. And so that is so powerful. Apply, apply, apply. We got a apply, lot of churches. Apply, apply, <laughs> apply. Praise God. Amen. Apply, apply, apply. And so want to thank you, Dr. Dorhauer. Want to thank you, Reverend Goodwin. Want to thank you, Bishop Flunder, for being here with us on tonight for this powerful conversation. I know people are... I see people still commenting, still taking stuff away. I know that people will go back and play the replay, share it with your congregations, uh, uh, share it with other denominations as well. This is a, this is a, a bishop always says, y'all come. This is y'all come. This is everybody coming. So this is the kind of conversations that we have. We see you, Tara Barber. Thank you so much for uh, how you three, the three of you have impacted this conversation in such a powerful way. We're going to move to our advertisement and we're going to ask that Bishop Funder will give the first announcement. God bless all of you. We are so glad always to be in the company of our beloved who come to be a part of this conversation and to vision with us, to vision together. What is the will of the divine for us moving forward? And I want to encourage you to help us, to help us support the gatekeepers and to grow. I believe that God intends growth in the kind of way in which we are being the church as the gatekeepers. Please support our broadcast by sending a donation via Cash App to dollar sign TFAM Annual, T-F-A-M 
A-N-N-U-A-L, or by PayPal, www.paypal.me forward slash TFAM Justice. Let's work together to build another way, another hope, another opportunity for us to join in bringing the kingdom of God to earth. God bless you is my prayer. Thank you, Dominic. Thank you, Bullet and Flight Radio. We appreciate your support. If you want to listen to uh, Beyond the Gatekeepers, you can listen to the to us on Bullet and Flight Radio. And so now we have an author. Her name is Courtney A. Brown, PhD. The book is A Life-Changing Journey Through the Life of Mephibosheth. The name of the book is Help. I've Fallen and I Can't. I'm sorry, and I Can Get Up. Help. I've fallen and I can get up. Courtney A. Brown, if you want to purchase that book, you can go to www.beyondthewallsoutreach.org. That's www.beyondthewalls, with an S, outreach.org. Rim Fellowship United Church of Christ, where their senior pastor is Bishop-elect Sonia E. Williams. They have just celebrated their 14th church anniversary, and they are inviting you to continue to join them on a weekly basis. Tuesday night is Bible study. Wednesday is morning prayer. They have children's church, and if you need more information, uh, you can go to their website. Their website is www.rimatl.org. That's www.rim atl.org their service starts at 1 p.m 1 p.m and then uh if you are wanting to give to them in any way you can go to their cash app is dollar sign rim church or to their facebook live which is rim fellowship ucc uh you can email them if you like their email address is rim at gmail.com Thank you so much for your support, Rim Fellowship United Church of Christ, Bishop-elect Sonia E. Williams. And we have Antonio Mattier. He's the lifestyle realtor. He's saying donate to your church. Lifestyle Global Properties will donate 10% of the commission earned from uh, your real estate transaction to your choice of city of refuge, COR, or TFAM in your name when you utilize their brokerage to purchase or sell a property residential or commercial in California or Georgia. So please, you can look up Antonio Mattier. His uh, email address is antonio at antoniomattier.com or you can go to his website at www.antoniomattier.com. Please support black businesses. We have the Healing Place Apothecary. It is the uh, business of Nubian Flunder, who is the daughter of our presiding bishop. She is the founder of this particular company. It is the Healing Place Apothecary. You can go to the website at www.thpapothecary.com to purchase products for your skin. She has black soap, rose water, raw shea souffle, daily greens, daily fruit, root oil, so many other things. Please make your purchase. Uh, support black businesses. Then we have Sky Michelle. Sky Michelle's Teas and Things, where a kid is the boss. And everybody knows that Sky Michelle has a t shirt company. She does customization. Follow her on Facebook and on Instagram at I am Sky Michelle. And you can go to her website at www.skymichelle.com. You will know that this is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And during this month, she has wonderful t shirts up. If you want to purchase a t-shirt to support someone uh, with breast cancer, someone who is fighting breast cancer, or just to support uh, $5 of whatever you purchase will go to uh, the Susan Coleman Foundation. Thank you so much. Support black businesses. 
And we have Inspire. It's returning on November 5th uh, by Cara, highlighting BIPOC entrepreneurs, influencers, and creatives on a mission to change their communities and the world. The host is Sue A. Webley. She's the founder of Cara Solutions, LLC. You can watch her live on Facebook, on uh, LinkedIn, on YouTube, and on Twitter as well. You can you can listen later on Spotify, Amazon Music, and Google Podcasts. And so uh, there's a link tree that you can look at, and it just says link tree, uh, hyph, I'm sorry, forward slash watch inspire. Thank you for supporting Black businesses. Advertise with Beyond the Gatekeepers. You can do that by emailing us Beyond the Gatekeepers Show at gmail.com. That's Beyond the Gatekeepers Show at gmail.com. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we say God bless you. Have a wonderful evening, and we will see you next week. Thank you.